One of the things that we've been speaking about is the Black Lives Matter movement and the way that different permutations have manifested in the Caribbean. We're very happy to be speaking with Rizé Chatterton Charles, who is the owner and a lead photographer of I1 Visuals, which is a full-service photography company specializing in weddings, portrait, and fashion photography. Now, her work reflects her passionate protectiveness for black women and how the beauty of black women is represented in this world. We are also speaking this evening with Tiffany Taylor, who is a graphic designer working with Designers Coast, a boutique design company working to international standards. She is also involved in the blog Becoming Anti-Racist, and it's been described as a resource list for all white or past for white Bajans, as well as other white people living in Barbados, and this is happening since June this year. So we say good afternoon, ladies, Rizé and Tiffany. How are you today? I'm very well. Thank you very much for having me, DK. It is. Hi, thanks for having us. It is our pleasure. Now, I want to set the context that neither of you are being asked to speak for the organizers of the Blackout Tuesday movement, and but we, we're asking you about your perspective of it being in Barbados, as well as your personal experience dealing with race in Barbados. So, Rizé, I'll start off with you. Thank you. Your thoughts on the movement. Well, I was really happy to see that Barbadians had decided that now was the time to, to speak openly about the ways in which racism manifests in Barbados, which is very different from how it manifests in many other places. And I was really pleased to see that people were interested in something like Blackout Tuesday and were happy to support it. So that's that was a that was a wonderful thing for me to see and i was disappointed to see how difficult it was for white barbados to also get on board with that action just for one day because it seemed like a very difficult thing for many people to process as being positive and i'll ask you the same question please tiffany in terms of your thoughts on the move on the movement and even before you give us your thoughts no, we've said Blackout Tuesday, but can you give us a little overview of some of the things that you're seeing in terms of like, what, what is Blackout Tuesday? Well, I mean, I have the poster pulled up here and I mean, straight from the organizers, it says it's a day to use economic power to fight racial injustice and economic disparity. And I mean, that's a good thing. It is interesting, like Risi said, that there has been so much pushback. And I say so much, social media can amplify things, but... There definitely was pushback, and it's interesting because even as a white person, when it came up and I saw it, your initial response is a little bit of discomfort, but I think the, the place where the conversation is now is when you feel that discomfort, you need to pause and go, hold on, why am I feeling that and examine that? Because I think that is part of the legacy of race relations and racism and all of that that we've inherited is discomfort with even talking about or addressing these things. And so when I saw the poster and I was like, there is nothing intrinsic in that that I should be worried about. So why would white Barbadians kind of get defensive? And so I kind of took to social media with some thoughts and conversations I had had with friends going, you know, if this was a call for people that have disabilities and they wanted a day to bring awareness to their businesses, to help promote them, that they can do better, have a better audience, all of those things, because we recognize that they have hurdles in their way. None of us would feel you know, defensive or singled out or attacked as able-bodied people. So in the same way, white people have zero reason to feel attacked or singled out, or even worse, sometimes we'll turn around and say, oh, well, that's racist. But I think that that's using a very naive, beginner introduction to racism definition and we need to move past that and listen and try and understand really what this conversation is and what's going on. Now in terms of moving past sometimes you need to come back to get a little idea of context. Now Tiffany I like the fact that you spoke of legacy. So Rise, I want to ask you and I'll ask you after Tiffany give me a little background a little look at your experience what 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 is the look of racism as you may have seen or experienced in Barbados? Well, as Tiffany said, we need to define terms. And when we define 
white people in Barbados, when we talk about white Bajans, white Bajans is such a broad term here, and it can encompass people who are of mixed ethnicity and people who don't and necessarily ethnically look quite white, but still fit into that category in Barbados. And in terms of my experiences in Barbados, Barbados has entire schools that are populated by mostly white people where white Bajans still make up less than 3% of or 280-ish or so thousand people. And I find that is a little bit odd. You will find that even amongst that very small segment of the society, there are people who have their close friends are only white people or mostly white people or white people plus a few white adjacent people. And that's the way ma racism tends to manifest in social settings in Barbados. In economic settings, you will have companies where the closer you get to upper management, the lighter people's skins get. And no one is ever able to say these things or to quantify these things with studies because we often, we seem very averse to actual studies of how racism manifests in Barbados. And I would love to see more of them if, if that would happen. So it's often just us looking at, 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 um, at businesses and seeing how the business looks. It is often us looking at schools and noticing that the more you get darker skinned Bajans or Bajans who are not in the upper classes attending certain schools, you will see that there's a drift out of that school of the white Bajans. So, so all of those things are ways in which racism in Barbados tends to manifest. And I don't know if Tiffany, you know, has different experiences from, from me on that. Um. I think all of those are valid points. I think something that jumps out as well is I believe a lot of white people will hear those things and go, but I'm not racist because, you know, I do have racist friends and I'm not hanging out with white people because I dislike black people. It's just because this is the way things happened and da, 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 da. And there's, there's reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think the important thing for white people to sit back and, and realize is it's not about going, oh, well, you're bad because this is the situation and this is what's happened. But we do have to go, but why is this? And is this, you know, intention versus impact? What's the impact of this bubble that we're creating around ourselves on the wider Barbadian society? How did we get here? The history that we know that we came from and really go, this can create problems, like you said, in the education system, like even all today, people are sitting, kids are sitting common entrance. And our whole education system is kind of good school and bad school and resources um, being allocated. It can't be equal because how would you have good school and bad school? It's not the children's fault. Um, but if we're not all paying attention because we're safe in our bubble and it's not affecting us, things aren't going to get better for everybody. And the impact of that is a problem. It doesn't make you bad if you have white friends, but do you care about the implications in broader society and how Barbados is going to move forward and look like in 20 years? And if you do, we need to kind of pay attention. I know, ladies, I want to take a break. When I come back, I want to know, I want to ask about the impact of what some of what you've just said about upon your work because both of you all are in the creative sector but we do that when we return from this break stay with us welcome back thank you for staying with us we're speaking with rosea chatterton charles and tiffany taylor uh, from uh, the beautiful island of Barbados. And um, ladies, I'm asking whether or not the experiences, what kind of experiences have uh, influenced you as creatives? And I'll start with you, Rizé, because you speak about passionate protectiveness for black women and how beauty is represented in this world. So that idea of representation kind of ties in with some of the words that you all have said before in terms of physical looks, social circles, economic impact. Rosé? Well, sure. I, I'll say that 
one of the things that had a lasting impact on me when I was a child was being about eight years old when I first came to Barbados and having an ad agency come to my school and say that they wanted articulate, um, interesting children to participate in this particular commercial. And I noticed it really quickly. There was one dark skinned girl and everybody else was light skinned and their interpretation seemed to be very clearly that the articulate and interesting children were all the light skinned children with, and preferably with green eyes, preferably with curly hair. They didn't necessarily want white kids, but there was certainly this idea that the darker kids were less than. And when the ad eventually came out, the dark skinned person was kind of the token in the back. And I noticed that at eight years old. And even as I grew into an adult, I noticed not only in Barbados, but internationally, what was considered to be beautiful was anyone who was not too dark, whose hair was not too kinky, and who had attributes that kind of fit into a particular Eurocentric um, version of whiteness. So if you were dark and your eyes were green, you, you were in. If you had mixed ancestry and it was visible, then you were definitely considered beautiful. So for a long time, I actually worked on a project specifically to photograph dark skinned women and a variety of women and to show them that they were beautiful, that they, that they did not have to adhere to narrow Eurocentric versions of what beauty could be. And that definitely influenced how I approached my photography. I, I love the diversity of Caribbean women. Um, every island, there is, a, there is a wide range of what is considered beautiful and you know, yay to my Caribbean people for having such openness to loving different kinds of Caribbean beauty but I wanted to be able to document that. I also worked on a series where I took um, European goddesses and I reinterpreted them through the lens of, an, of a black woman, of a black Caribbean woman. So we took um, Demeter and I reimagined Demeter as a beautiful dark skinned um, goddess with dreadlocks and those are the kinds of things that influence my work so. and, and that actually kind of reminds me of something that someone once told me they're waiting for the day when on and actually working towards it as well when people of uh, darker hues or as Curtis Mayfield said we the people who are darker than blue can be considered attractive without having to go through the filter of being described as exotic before considered attractive but Tiffany what's your take on this um, my take uh, on what, a professional level or a personal level? I mean, a professional level, a lot of what I do is graphic design and advertising. And it is interesting, say, for example, because if you use a lot of resources from overseas, obviously it's very centered on light-skinned white people, but we're catering to a not light-skinned, not white market here. And it makes, more, it makes it more challenging. It's something I've noticed over the years has improved being able to say fine stock photography and all those things that show a range of things. But like Reese says, a lot of the time it will tend to be a, a more lighter skinned, mixed looking person that you'll find a lot more of that kind of stuff. Um, there has been the instance, it's, it's interesting because there have been instances say where I've had clients, I find like hair, the representation of black hair tends to be a touchy point. And obviously I'm just trying to help my clients who very often times the person I'm liaising with is a black Barbadian, but they'll be like, well, I don't like her hair being so natural or this or that. And I have the tension of going, that's the hair that comes out of her head and it looks good, but you're the client I'm trying to please you. And sometimes those things can happen. Um, on a personal level, I mean, you grew up a minority, you know that you're different, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, a, a numerical minority in Barbados, not minority in the sense of America, but yeah, we absorb so much media from elsewhere. So say that same stock issue where you're looking for stock imagery, all the media we absorb is from elsewhere too, and it's very Eurocentric. So even though we are a minority in terms of the numbers in the Caribbean, 
we are still accustomed to seeing ourselves represented frequently, not in the Caribbean sense, which is a particular niche, but that's a particular niche. You wouldn't expect it as much. And with regard to staying on, staying on the personal side with you, Tiffany, uh, one of the things that you've recently been involved in is the anti-racist blog. Give me, how, how, did that, how did that come up and what has it been like thus far? That came up more or less from me being a bit of a loudmouth on social media and then an acquaintance from school messaging me and feeling like there was a need for it. It was really her idea. It was not my idea. And she just thought that, you know, there's so much out there in terms of this conversation, but it's very American centric. And because our demographics are so different, the conversation is different. Um, white people are a very small minority in Barbados. We're only 3%. And so a lot of the conversations as it relates to race in America and the police and different things does not apply in the same way. And I think sometimes that makes us feel that, you know, there's no problem. But the thing is, there is a problem still. The, the, the same ideas, the same roots of racism and racist thoughts still exist in society. They just show themselves differently because of the demographic makeup. And us making this blog was so that when people come into these conversations, they have somewhere that they can go to kind of see it fleshed out a bit. Because if we just go by our instinct and by what we're taught as kids, I think a lot of us are operating with that preschool definition of racism. Racism is, I don't like you because you're a different skin tone. And unfortunately, that becomes a very convenient definition because we can distance and go, it's bad people. It's bad people in the past with slavery or it's bad people in America with the police, but it's not an issue with us. But that, that same thing of like, oh, it's bad people hating other people. We need to move beyond that and go, hold on, how did these ideas get formed? What was the purpose of these ideas? And a lot of the time, the purpose of these racist ideas were to make white people feel better. You know, in the times of slavery, we wanted to feel better about what was going on. And so we created reasons that made it okay for slavery to be what it was so that we could benefit. And we've moved past slavery in that form, but sometimes some of the underlying ideas and that, even that instinctive, like, ooh, this makes me uncomfortable. Therefore, it must be racist because you're making me think about the color of my skin. That's a problem that we need to try and understand better. Um, and so the point of the, the blog resource list was to help explore that. And even in doing it myself, I learned a lot or things that I kind of had a little idea of. You go, oh, wow, this makes so much more sense. And you know, you, Tiffany, you, you consider yourself a bit of a loudmouth on social media. You say <laughs> you're not that far back and you are very outspoken with your views. Um, people have started coming for you on some of your platforms. Um, what has that experience been like with regard to this, this particular situation? Rissé? Rissé. Was that for me? Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. thank you. So you, you've, oh. been, you've been outspoken about your views as well, and you, you, you said that people have started coming for you. You've, you've been taking receipts and stuff. What has that experience been like? Um... Coming for me, I mean, I, I guess I I feel like I feel very strongly about what I say, and I try to be very careful about what I say. So, there, the people who are coming for me in that sense, <laughs> I, I I wish them luck. I wish them luck. I'm I don't. I think someone tried, they often say, okay, let me try to try clarify my thoughts. I'm so sorry. Um, as Tiffany said, the preschool definition of racism that you dislike someone because of the color of their skin and that is racist. Therefore, white people can be racist because they dislike black people based on the color of their skin and black people can be racist because they dislike white people because of the color of their skin. That is a very basic, definition of racism and even the oxford dictionary at this time has revised their definition of what it means to be or what racism actually means and it no longer includes um such simplistic 
language. So when people decide that, oh, I must hate white people because I am saying that things need to change, I, I am less bothered because my concern is that they do not actually understand what racism actually means and in modern times. And, and definitely in terms of moving with that modern times, a situation as nuanced and as expansive as this, definitely we would have run out of time and this is what we've done right now. But Rizé, Chadaton Charles and Tiffany Taylor, thank you so much for reaching across the waters to share some time with us. So I'm DK Rosta on behalf of the entire news team. Thank you for joining us and good night.